Hello and welcome back to another bootstrap tournament video here. We are going to talk about all the rebalance values that are present in the bootstrap rebalance here for the multiplayer tournament. And we are starting out with some ranged units, as you can see. And we will not really uh, talk in depth about all of the units, like we will just scratch them on the surface. And if you want to have a real in-depth analysis, and have a real in-depth overview of all of the values that got changed compared to vanilla. Check out the link in the video description to go to our GitHub page where Altavos has summarized most of the units and yeah, written, has written some texts um, and put up all of the detailed changes in the changelog. But yeah, without further ado, I would say we are jumping into the first range unit here, which is the Slinger. And Slingers are most used in the early game. They have some small slight buffs against some late game melee units to compensate for their insane health increases. And other than that, they are really just a really cheap range unit to put out a lot of damage. They are already really strong on their own, but usually you pair them with other um, archers or some archers at least, because uh, what they really suck against is um, enemy archer fire from afar but if you don't really notice that there are archers shooting at you you can lose a lot of stingers quite quickly and usually you want to run in and attack these archers and as soon as you hold your stingers in position they instantly shoot so there's one uh, mechanic here that i want to show you as well for stingers is um, if you have stingers to fight against enemy stingers you can even win with a smaller number let's have like 15 stingers of red and let's come in with like 12 stingers of blue. And I will show you how you can win against these 15 stingers spread. Because you can just hold position. And before the enemy notices that you're in range, you can already shoot them. Giving your stingers basically the first shot and that will usually win you the battle. That is because they have an update cycle for shooting shots at each other. Usually you raid with assassins and slaves in the early game. But with just two slingshots, you can usually uh, kill these. And yeah, slaves die really quickly against slingers. If you're um, putting them up here, you can see uh, they die really quickly. Other units that usually have to be defended are assassins. And with assassins, um, there's a... Yeah, basically you have like five slingers for every assassin. So, yeah, this would not be representable here. And even then, we killed one assassin, right? So, it's still priced the performance worth to use slingers, but you need to micro them. Otherwise, the assassins may reign supreme because they got an insane in, um, damage against slingers because they already had a big base damage against slingers and now they even got 50% more. Let's look at these archers here which is usually the next unit you will get, and these uh, Arabian Archers. And Arabian Archers got huge buffs in health and resistance to arrows, while these only got a slight buff to health. And that is because Arabian Archers were way, way too expensive. And now they also got a cost decrease to 65 gold. So they're almost worth to buy, but as soon as you get both produced, yeah, it's just better to get European Archers because they just outshine Arabian Archers in numbers. And because with uh, ranged troops, they usually scale kind of quadratic with the numbers. Um, means you get like quadratic power of, of the number because of the, their health multiplied by their um, damage output. You uh, usually want to have um, yeah more units rather than just a few elite. And yeah, so I would advise to use these uh, Arabian units here, these Arabian archers, in the early game. And just a few of them spread around the map on high ground positions, especially to defend against early slinger pushes. Because what they do well is, uh, as you saw, shoot slingers from afar when the enemy doesn't really notice. And you can also harass your opponent by attacking their slinger groups that are out on the map to defend. Yeah, so these archers... What is their special trait? So they got some health increase, right? But yeah, what are they good against? Um, I would say not swordsmen. I can demonstrate this real quick by... Let's move them over here. Um, let's get just a few swordsmen here. And these swordsmen, I mean, they will still get a lot of damage by these archers. 
But you can see how long they survive, right? They all they even reach these archers and they slay them immediately. And yeah, against European swordsmen this would be even more devastating. Let's uh, see me this real quick. Let's assume we have like 30 archers over here. And then there are some European swordsmen coming in. And these should completely obliterate these archers because archers just cannot deal with swordsmen. Swordsmen have an insane health pool, especially resistance against archers. They will slay them like this. They are basically doing nothing here. You can see one of them is just yellow. And yeah, that is, is just insane. So for these, you definitely want to have crossbowmen. Uh, I will show this real quick. Crossbowmen deal with swordsmen way better than uh, archers. Even then, swordsmen have an insane health pool. You can see that. And they get shot. But um, yeah, the swordsmen uh, do way worse against these crossbowmen here. And yeah, that is also the, the theme here because crossbowmen also not only kill swordsmen really easily, but also they one-shot European archers. That is the same as in the vanilla base game. Um, let's have like, uh, like outnumber the crossbowmen and not by a bit, but by a long shot. And put like 50 archers over here. And you will see these will completely get obliterated here. The, these uh, crossbowmen don't even break a sweat. Yes, we had some of them here, but uh, they didn't really contribute much. We can just redo this experiment real quick. And you will see. So as soon as there is a lot of archers out on the field, what is usually worth is to get a bunch of crossbowmen to completely um, knock them out. And crossbowmen also are very good against these, uh, like these Arabian swordsmen. Uh, let's put a bunch of them here and send them in. You will see they completely destroy these Arabian swordsmen before they can even get close. There's no way. But and then there's another unit which is usually present in the mid game. And that is the Macemen. And Macemen, uh, yeah, they're one of the most common used mid game units. Basically kind of a must play at this point because they got insane buffs they got some damage and health buffs uh, for them and what they excel at is stacking against units and what they do they especially um, got some uh, resistance against crossbowmen they added onto them so they can deal with them but what they don't do well is deal with archers especially price to performance wise european archers are still good to defend against them of course um, the main theme here of the whole rebalance, that is important to notice. The whole theme of the rebalance here is that uh, melee troops got buffed mostly and ranged troops got just adjusted or like buffed slightly. They basically get outshine, like the, the, the melee units outshine the, the ranged units by far. And that is because in the vanilla base game, they saw that uh, ranged units were the only unit that were really used because. Um, yeah, most of the other units that were used are just like knights or maybe assassins or something like that. But yeah, the range units were just OP. And so we decided that there must be an end to this and we buffed most of the especially late game oriented uh, melee units immensely so they can break a, a defense. Yeah, so let's um, even with this high ground position here for these crossbow, let's put also some other units in. And it's probably something you might uh, think of being interesting here and it's the monk the monk is a melee unit that is really cost efficient uh, for the melee fighting and they got nerfed against swordsmen so they only do do 50 percent damage against swordsmen because swordsmen are already kind of op right so let's send them into these crossbowmen here we have 15 crossbowmen of course you would think oh that is not much but these 15 crossbowmen, they kind of worth as much as these monks here. So, could be a fair fight. And yeah, that is a special thing here. Monks take three shots to kill for the crossbowmen. Now you can see uh, we have a lot of monks left. And yeah, let's, let's just kill them. So, now we do the same experiment with archers. As you can see, just put a lot of archers over here. Maybe 21 is... Basically as much value as the crossbowman, maybe a slight bit less even. Let's put the same anti-monks over here. Let's see if we can click fast enough. 
And I want to just show you the kind of uh, principle that we've balanced by. And that is by... Um, the archers usually do well against light units and crossbowmen usually do well against heavy units. So that is the main principle here. So in case you want to bid one type of unit, you want to, to check if it's more like light unit or more like a heavy unit. And you can see these archers completely obliterate these marks. See? Even if they reach them, at the end the archers win. And that is so obvious, right? So the archers really do well against marks, for example. And it's just a demonstration. So archers like the, the Macemen here, for example, they're kind of light, yeah, they're not super light, but they are uh, kind of mid-game to light mini unit, and archers do quite well against them. And yeah, but small groups of archers still cost efficient traits, and against uh, Spearman, for example, that is also a well-used melee unit now. Uh, Spearmen now uh, do more damage against knights. They deal basically 30 damage against knights and have still their 20 base damage. But their cost also got reduced and they got a slight resistance against archers increase. As, as far as I can remember. Maybe they don't get the archers resistance. Just check it out on the, on the thing. But they still got kind of obliterated the archers. You can see they reached the archers and they, they kill them. But we needed a lot of them. And yeah. Against horse archers though. You can see they completely obliterate these horse archers because of their buff against um, yeah, horse units, basically. Now, if I put a knight in the middle of them, they will get all slain, even though they are good against knights. Kind of, this isn't really the case. They are just cost efficient against knights, not really strong against knights. See, this knight is uh, probably as valuable as uh, 10 or 15 of these um, spearmen. So still trade cost efficiently okay i'm talking too much all at once so let's take a look at the last range units that i left prepared and that is the fire thrower we will take a look at the melee units in a moment again and the fire throw is an interesting one because we buffed just their uh, health mostly so that they can withstand fire much longer and you should usually accompany them by putting some Pikemen or other supporting units. Pikemen are one of the best melee supporting units. We will also get to that. Um, put them on top of each other and then you can basically uh, win melee fights. Especially if you have a big army of like heavy units and some fire throws within. You can definitely win against these um, kind of low tier uh, early game units that might push into you. By just having the fire throw throw the fire. And you can see how fast these Spearmen and uh, Macemen have burned down, right? And the same is also true for Arabian Swordsmen. I mean, this is a small group, so they should not really do that well, but... Yeah, Arabian Swordsmen get also killed by fire quite easily. Demonstrate this really quick. So, yeah, just alone here. You can see the Arabian Swordsmen just got completely obliterated. So you want to use fire throws mainly to defend your um, melee troop compositions of, like, high-value and high health millions like these pikemen and you can also see um if you haven't noticed yet these also take some more uh arrows because of their increased health they take longer to kill so they're way more resistant they don't just like die instantly like in vanilla where they, you couldn't really play with them anyhow and yeah let's finish these archers off really quick and yeah, you can see. Okay. Anyways, let's head on to the next units. And that is the melee units. We want to take a look at ones that we've already looked at, but yeah, more in detail. So the slaves, these are basically the same as before, and you mostly use them in the early game. Like, you want to build slaves because they are so cost efficient at killing buildings. As you incinerate a building, especially small buildings, like woodcutting, uh, woodcutter's huts or so. Um, they die basically before anyone could uh, distinguish them, right? Woodcutter's huts and hunter's huts also have like a unique ability now that they don't spread the fire because uh, their health is so little that they actually burn down before they can spread fire, before their first fire spreading animation. You can also check this out over here. Wait, this was the wrong color. And so, yeah, your slave 
Uh, if it doesn't start in the fire, it might even survive. But this one here, for example, is still able to spread the fire just as before. And if you didn't know, your own buildings cannot be incinerated by your own fire. The game knows who caused this fire and will not incinerate your own buildings. Very nice, right? Okay, slaves kind of uh, accelerate not only with sending out single slaves, just I would recommend sending one here and like on each building that you find just send like one slave and attack, right? One might make it through, one may kill a building. But if your opponent um, defends well and knows how to defend against slaves, especially with archers in the early game, like they have some archers around, right? They would shoot these slaves, no problem. Let's run them by here. I don't know. And then... Yeah, these, these are in the way here. So these slaves would die so fast, right? They get basically one shot by these archers. One arrow, one kill. So what you do is you mix in one archer of your own. Like you mix a horse archer and some slaves. And you can even micro that horse archer to take the shots. Because the enemies will always priority that horse archer. And you can run down your enemy buildings with these slaves without any uh, pro problems, right? You can just run in, kill them, and maybe you want to even mix some slingers in that. Because they kind of get treated like slaves, and they kind of get ignored because this archer would shoot at this uh, horse archer here. It's a nice tactic to just use like one horse archer here. And yeah, horse archers also didn't get changed as much. Like, they're still the same unit as before, but they got basically nerfed by every other unit getting buffed. Plus, um, yeah, they don't have the shield bonus anymore, but we will get to that later, yeah. Okay, so now with the with the slaves out of the way, the assassin. You already covered the assassin earlier, but what you usually want to do, you want to rally point the assassin over the map. The rally point, though, got nerfed a bit. The assassin is not able to run at full speed anymore to the rally point. Usually they were faster towards the rally point, but now they are the same speed as walking around like this. And yeah, the special ability of the assassin is, of course, it's invisible. Exactly. And it does 50% more damage against, um, yeah, uh, archers and ranged units, basically. But what it is not good at is um, killing other melee units. And, for example, one of the main tactics earlier was, like, killing the Lord with assassins, right? This is still definitely possible. Like, we had eight, just eight assassins here. But it's not possible with as little numbers. And especially if the enemy lord runs away and kites your assassins, you're not having a good time. Usually it's easy to defend against assassins, especially if you have other melee units. Like this, for example. You can see just this one swordsman killed all of these assassins. And yeah, it's not a good time for the assassins. Though the assassin, as mentioned before, are able to kill workers really quick. And that is also a unique trait for them. Like my, sometimes it might just be valuable to run into the enemy's economy, stand next to the granary and kill all of the workers coming in. And the enemy might not even notice that they don't have any workers left and that there might be an assassin in their castle. Unless, of course, they pay attention to this uh, nice slashing noise that occurs. Let's see. You can, see. You can hear this uh, sound like this, right? And yeah, when you have the... Assassins in your opponent's castle, you want to also aim for the most valuable buildings, of course, like the granary. Like, uh, let's place some buildings around. And the armory, and now the granary and the armory, if I'm correct, they should have the same health now, yeah. And what we kind of balanced around for raiding units like these and slaves and stuff, I already mentioned these buildings, like woodcutting hut and, um, uh, the hunter's hut the more it's just a general rule right the more a building costs like this uh, farm for example costs 15 wood so it has more health than a farm that costs like 10 wood so the more a building costs usually the more health it has so for example this armor here let's put that out let's put it out on the map let's put just two of this yeah. and you can put these in order, like this. Like, this armor costs more than this blacksmith and so on. We will get to the exact uh, building costs later. But it costs more, so it takes longer to kill, right? So even though this assassin is already working on this armor, the other assassin is probably killing this blacksmith at almost the same speed. Exactly. And yeah. Um, that is 
with Raiding Girls like the Assassin. And yeah, then we come to the Arabian Swordsman. And yes, you can saw already the Arabian Swordsman got quite some buffs. So for example, it's now faster. It runs at uh, pikeman speed. You can see we can compare these. So these got a lot faster basically. They run now at pikeman speed. And they also do a lot more damage and have some health increase. They still suck against uh, crossbowmen, but they slash. Like one or two of them, yeah. And already, like three of them might already kill the Lord. If I'm check that the Lord is uh, coming back. Maybe they can already kill the Lord, I'm not sure. But uh, three of them already definitely damaged the Lord a lot. I don't know, maybe we need another one. And another one. One by one here. You can see it's definitely a, a serious threat to your enemy lord. Push with his uh, Arabian Swordsman. And these Arabian Swordsman usually are used in the early to mid game to um, take positions from your opponent, especially against archers and slingers out on the map. You want to just push with a few and take like the position around a stone quarry or something. So you can position your stone quarry there or like take it back from your opponent if they attack you. They're mostly, mostly used for defense, of course. But sometimes also pushed offensively across the map. The problem though is offensively they kinda suck because you see them from a mile away before they arrive and you can usually have some counterplay ready for them. But it might be a good surprise. Anyway, so uh, let's check out some European units, right? You wanted to talk about the Spearmen. As you already saw, they do increased damage to enemy horse archers especially and even against some knights. Oh, let's see it like this here, yeah. So, yeah, of course. So the, the spearmen definitely are worth to build even when the enemy has knights already. But what you usually find the most in is uh, early game pushes and early game uh, timing attacks. And you probably have like a few, maybe you, you have like one or two at the start and get like 20, 30 spearmen up quite quickly because spears are produced so fast. And then your opponent might have just some archers spread around like this. And you can easily run them over because uh, yeah, they have nothing basically. They need even they, like they need a lot of slingers to defend this. And if they have slingers, you usually bring your own archers with your spearmen. Like archers and spearmen go well together against the early slinger defense. Yeah, and later on in the game, when you transition to pikemen and don't produce spears anymore, you usually want to use the spears in a group with the macemen that you have from the mid game. Um, and just trade them off. Basically use them as a shield for your macemen. And let's put some archers up here again. So let's assume basically we are fighting. So we want to use our spearmen as a shield. For our macemen to actually do the damage and that way if you take less damage to your macemen and get into your base uh, like enemy base economy and can even run them over maybe kill the lord even these pushes these are really really dangerous in the bootstrap meta with macemen and spearmen together macemen as i thought uh, you have increased health and strength and you usually have a mid game transition the first iron that is uh, coming in is usually spent on mace production right so when you use the maze production and get this maze, you can make a timing attack and maybe win the game. And later on, you want to switch that maze production to swords production. As soon as you have enough iron and enough gold left over, you might even want to go into knights first. Some people just go into swordsmen. There's multiple strategies. Swordsman pushes only deal a lot of damage if the enemy doesn't really have crossbowmen around. Knights can even do a lot of damage even if the enemy has a crossbowmen around. That's you might see in a second here. So, let's put some crossbowmen out on the field. And especially what these swordsmen and knights are well against is... Uh, they especially do well against... Uh, they do well against any unit really because knights are completely broken. They cost also a lot of uh, gold, but yeah. They definitely do well against um, macemen, for example. Like, your enemy has still this macemen army. And you might have your own knights, right? Say we have like our first stable. 
And this first David army here, that's why you also want to mix these spearmen with the Macemen. This first spear, uh, this first David army here already completely obliterated this whole troop of Macemen and spearmen. So knights are really dangerous. Yeah, let's look at the cost of these different units here. We already looked at the pikemen too. Let's demonstrate a little bit of like how pikemen uniquely defuse traps. Like pikemen have the most health in the whole game. And they're doing especially well against these uh, like pits here on the field. Oh wait, this is the... I don't know. Actually, they, they work through these. You can see like they take them no problem. And yeah, still all of them alive. And they might even be able to still defend against three knights. Let's see. Even if they're low health. Because pikemen deal insane damage to knights. So you can see they still... That knights. They also do like almost no damage. They have 20 base damage as the spearmen. But they do 60 damage against knights. So these are kind of the main melee counter against knights. Especially if you have a big army. You want to mix in some pikemen to defend against these uh, insane knight pushes that come in the late game. And yeah, um, let's look at all of the costs of these units because why are the millions so good? They also, like, when they are so good, they need to also be expensive, right? So we look at all of the weapon costs. And for example, the iron armor, which is usually used to get the most expensive, the most precious endgame melee units, it sells for 40 gold a pop, right? So you can calculate by this. You have like 34 plus 40 plus 40 gold for the recruitment. Already 114 gold just to build the swordsman in sale cost. If you want to buy this armor and weapon stuff, it costs even more. And now the insane um, prices for these buildings here, right? Actually, they don't cost that much gold anymore. But we've switched around the blacksmith and the armor. The armor is the one that is most expensive now. It costs um, 20 wood, 16 stone, and... 150 gold and you can basically see that this costs as double the stone and double the gold from the blacksmith. The blacksmith costs 8 stone, 75 gold and 20 wood. This one 10 wood and uh, 6 stone and uh, 50 wood. This one costs, costs no stone at all. The Fletcher is the only one that doesn't compete with the other melee troop buildings. It uh, basically is mainly used for flat, like for, for um, defenders, right? So it only costs no stone. It has 100 gold and 20 wood attached to it. And this one here costs only 4 stone, 10 wood and 50 gold. This is really cheap. The tunnel is not that efficient though. Usually you have to wait a bit until the first uh, leather armor is produced. So rather build it earlier and get the cheese farm. And you also have to protect your cheese farm to make it worth, right? have to have the secondary building there and you occupy a farm slot for you so yeah there's some hidden costs in that anyways um of course this has the least uh, health here like, and this these have way more health because they cost more and with these uh, weapon costs and building costs explained you might want to also look at some of the siege engines because they also got some stone and other resources attached to it so let's look at the first range unit here first because it fits with the theme that we are looking at the knights and yeah wait we haven't looked at the stable yet okay sorry the stable of course the most expensive building of all of the weapon buildings here if you count horses as weapons the stable costs 400 gold 40 stone and 40 wood so it is really really expensive and you have to really care and get the resources to build a stable before you can get the knights and it might be even worth to rush out for a stable to get the early knights because of how valuable they are. And as soon as you got knights, you can just trade them off and you still get always like your, your gold efficiency back, right? They have cost efficient trades against almost everything if you don't factor in the stable cost, right? Okay, so how to deal with knights? You can of course build crossbowmen, as I said, but you need a large mass of that. What you can also do is build fire ballistas. And... Yeah, fire ballistas, one of the usually banned buildi um, buildings, units in peacetime. One of the strongest units already in the base game got buffed even further, right? That is ridiculous, people might say. But actually, no, it's not ridiculous because they also cost a lot. They cost 5 pitch, 150 gold and 2 engineers. And usually you need to also make them work first. There's 
many ways to defend against these. Like you can use counterplay and uh, like just uh, surrounding them, getting cheap units to surround them, because they also overshoot on enemies. But yeah, let's simulate them against high value units like these knights, right? Let's uh, yeah, use, show you some counterplay against these, because now they cannot shoot this building anymore. Let's have 12 knights, which is basically as much as these 9 fire blisters cost. Maybe a bit less. And yeah, these these 9 knights, even though the fire blisters don't move, don't have any supporting unit, already have a struggle to kill all of these fire blisters. And yeah. I mean, knights are still uh, worth against fire blisters, as you can see here. But yeah, let's simulate this fight a bit more evenly. And get some engineers involved. And some. Let's get one more fire blister set up. And set them all in one place. And now, look at this. If you protect these fire blisters, of course, what we would do in a normal game, right? Um, let's put it like this. And now attack with the knights again. And maybe put even 20 because now it's such a big army there. Now ah, let's make 16 out of it. These monks don't be shit against knights. I mean, they're still good, but they're not that good. And you can see the knights, they get completely destroyed. There's nothing they can do. Let's, okay, let's get 20 on top of it. Just because we can. Usually always numbers of four, right? So this costs already five stables. As you can see, they are facing these, and yeah, what you would usually would want to do is spam click through the melee units just to get to the fire blisters right away. And yeah, what again? What about fire blisters with five pitch? You say that is cheap, but pitch actually is worth more. If you want to buy it now, you have to spend uh, 180 gold, I believe. Let's check it out. Yes, you can see here 180 gold for five pitch. So 180 gold plus 150 plus the two engineers on top. You can. Calculate yourself. The fire blisters really expensive. And one main counter to it is the catapult, right? The catapult, one of the even more expensive units, I guess. Because the catapults, they cost uh, 10 stone. And they cost also 150 gold on top. So 150 gold, 10 stone, and your two engineers. And yeah, that is also really expensive because 10 stone, yeah, if you don't have that, you need to buy it. 5 uh, stone for 50 gold. It's a bit cheaper than in vanilla. But yeah, these catapults are one of the main counters to fire blisters because one shot is still one kill. But they come with the downside, they only come with 10 ammo at the beginning. And when you reload them, you also only get 10 ammo for the reloading. So you spend 10 stone for 10 ammo, basically. Yeah, and catapults and triple chase here have a unique role in this game now. Because they're mainly meant... I mean, you can still use catapults against troops. But uh, especially triple chase are mainly meant to get used against um, buildings, against structures. And so let's look at all of the castle structures here that we have. We have the big round tower, we have the big square tower, we have this tower and this one and this one. So I will tell you the costs here. 75 stone, 40 stone, 20, 10 and 15 stone they cost. And they might also be protected by some walls. And yeah, basically what I want to show you here is that um, these buildings also got increased health, right? 350 health, 1000 health, 2000 health, that is as much as the round tower had before um, the, the changes. This one has 2250 health, slightly more than this, but costs way more to build the ballista on top. And this one has the 4500 health, so this one is really durable. And let's show you what these uh, catapults are doing. Yeah, they're not doing anything because they get blocked so they already shot three of the ammo oh yeah let's let's shoot here and you can see they demolish the wall like it's paper right but yeah they don't do much against this tower because this has so much health let's look at treble chase treble chase definitely rock like they they do so much damage they can kill these big towers way easier you can see this this one already got killed uh, in the collateral damage here this one withstands a bit, but still, like the the stone you need to repair this is worth more than the stone that they are shooting. So these treble chase 
definitely work against structures. You should always use trebuchets in the late game to kill your opponent's economy. But as you can see, both of them share the trait to have less stone in their um, yeah, in their stockpile basically when they get built. Yeah, what other siege engines we have? We have the shields, uh, a big unit, the like unit that got always used. It costs now six wood, so they got kind of slightly more expensive. And now they have the same speed as archers. Uh, not archers, uh, crossbowmen. Because, yeah, with archers, um, archers now outrun them. That is the, the thing. If you put like your horse archers, your usual horse archers on one and your shields on two, whatever, and you send them with each other, the horse archers always run faster than the shields, way faster. So they don't really stay in the protection field of them. So what you want to do, you want to only use shields really when you have a stationary advantage point that you can hold, because otherwise enemy uh, fast melee units might overrun the shields and your archers are without any protection against opponent's archers. So let's check these crossbowmen, for example. Um, crossbowmen run at the same speed as shields, so you can keep them in the field and even make them work. You can see that is really nice, right? Yeah, shields also have the, the ability to stand some more mangonel fire. That is also important here. So on this big tower, if you have a mangonel, uh, usually it shoots one rock, one kill, one unit dies instantly. Besides siege engines, they take a bit longer. And especially shields. Shields basically are needed to uh, withstand enemy magnet fire. There was sometimes the case that you had this insane stalemate battle at the end where you have like a lot of towers of magnets and they yeah, basically just uh, completely demolished any army that could just even get close. Even the trebuchets were outranged by the random spread of the magnet rocks. So yeah, now with shields you can withstand that. But on the other hand then the ballistas on towers they kill these shields really quickly and they also de do very well against normal units i guess yeah just to make it a bit more fair let's give these ballisters also a shield here yeah this sh uh, this ballister didn't last very long because we had no protection Let's assume the shield here, which withstands basically crossbows forever. Also, if you didn't know, height advantage, one third the damage. That is really important. If you have height advantage over your opponent, then you take only one third the damage. That is, though, is an exception against fire ballistas. Fire ballistas do full damage even against high ground. Same with ballistas. But uh, yeah, let's put two engineers here. Why am I taking so long? And you will see these, this ballista here basically can even kill shields. I mean the shields still withstand the ballista, but um, it's way faster now than before. I guess shields also cover your ass against ballista. Shields are still OP, but they are so slow you can get uh, them run down. Yeah, two more siege engines we have. That is uh, this battering ram and this, um, uh, this uh, siege tower here, and you might already notice it has way more health, right? The battering ram not only has more health though, let's put one of the most insane melee units here. It also withstands a lot of abuse against melee units. So melee units now don't deal as much damage anymore to battering rams. So you might want to consider uh, building battering rams, especially in, in the mid game to push for an advantage point or like get your enemy's cathedral killed or something like that. And yeah, protect your battering ram with a few own units of course, but yeah, they cost only three iron and a few wood and then you're good to go. The siege tower on the other hand costs 40 wood and is usually mostly used to unlock uh, paths on the map, unlock a special resource slot or something like that. And yeah, we can see this here they want to patrol so they don't get shot right yeah what else is there to say there is tunnelers tunnelers a special unit that was always underrated i think um it was already possible to kill these units here like these units and these towers with a one hit kill with the tunnel and uh, let's destroy this wall real quick so that the tunnels can attack this tower here and you will see this tower falls so quickly right this tower has so much health and you can see these tunnels here 
They do insane damage against towers, against walls. They are really, really good also at raiding early game. Uh, they will stand some slinger shots. And they can also kill enemy buildings quite quickly. You can see they really, really, really kill buildings fast. Like, let's say the woodcutter's hut, for example. This guy will kill the woodcutter's hut in one hit, right? It's insane. They really, really excel at breaking walls and killing buildings. So they got an insane buff to damage against uh, buildings. And the Thunder Skilled costs only 15 wood. So what they're really bad against is arrows. So as you saw, running into this arrow fire here from these cross archers, they still die quite quickly. And uh, you still need to micro them. Though they're fast. They're fast and faster than assassins in the early game to harass your opponent's economy. Uh, it's so quick to kill everything. Insane. Yeah, what else is there about the units? I think we got all the units covered now. If I forgot anything, let me know in the comments. I mean, Leatherman, for example, they are just used unlocking some paths on the map usually. But they're still kind of bugged by how the mechanic works. The units don't really pathfind over them unless there's no other path, which is kind of ridiculous at this point. Like, we cannot really fix it. And yeah, now we are getting to the economy part here. We've already covered the like increased costs of the weapon production. Let's look at some of the costs for the popularity equal. So we have these here, right? This is the base for popularity food. Uh, Hunter's Hut still cost 5, 10, 5, 15, and the Hobbs Farm got decreased in price. It's now 10 wood. And the main difference between these two buildings here is that the Hobbs Farm's worker only walks to the stockpile like two thirds of the times that the Weed Farm worker goes to the stockpile. And therefore, it doesn't have as much of a drop-off for long distances to the stockpile. So when you have a close-by farm spot for a wheat farm, like 30 tiles or so, or closer, you definitely want to build a wheat farm um, to get the bread economy. It's cheaper to build um, the bread economy and get the bread for pop like popularity maybe even. Uh, selling bread is definitely the, the more valuable um, the more valuable thing to do. But yeah, hops is also more valuable now because let's check it out. Um, over here, hops now sells for 21 a pop. So 105 for 5 hops. Before that, it was like uh, 40. And it's basically doubled, uh, almost tripled in price. And even the beer got adjusted as well. So it's like 1.5 times the hops um, because of how the ratio was determined before it's kind of left the same i think and with that um it's times always like it's almost always worth to build the hops farm if it's like a further out farm spot and just sell the hops or basically sell the beer by after transforming the hops into beer with breweries and you can of course just build like three breweries for one hops farm or even more if it's close by and the beer is also valuable but yeah for this one that is special because the beer uh, in costs now 30 wood and 15 stone. So it's really, really expensive to get popularity through beer by building costs. Because these cost so much uh, that it's also valuable to harass them. But it is usually not advised to get that in the early game. When you have like other resources that you can take on the map and stuff that is more uh, fast paced for your advancement. So you want to only go into beer after you've already established enough uh, wood and stone for everything else. And what you can do to compensate this loss of popularity when you don't have food anything, like when you cannot, uh, when you don't have enough wood for the bread economy, so you might only have some stone and some gold spare. Uh, don't buy wood, just build chapels. Chapels definitely um, work now. And also are kind of worth it because the priest is now a fast worker by default. We made him run a bit faster around the village and bless people. Therefore, he doesn't run after your woodcutter all the way all the way across the map and then fail to bless the woodcutter and maybe come back. But he's actually uh, blessing the people around him. So you want to spread your chapels around your village so that they don't all run after the same peasant but kind of equalize and... 
uh, bless all of the people in your economy. That way you can already get like uh, plus four religion for just 90 population with three or four uh, well-placed um, chapels. And later on, after 90 population, you might even want to build a church. Gives you another priest, but also gives you plus one flat out popularity for just 24 stone and 150 gold. And of course the cathedral, as soon as you want to have monks, this is always worth it. Gives you plus two flat popularity and it costs now 40 stone and 750 gold. So this is still the most expensive building, but the stable is a close second. Yeah, one more thing to note. The apothecary, uh, there is a healer in the game with the UCP we've um, introduced the healer's change. Meaning that you can heal up your units and therefore the apothecary is not only for having defense against diseased cows, but also to give you some healing power for like your lord if it's got damaged in the early game. That is one of the high value targets you want to heal up. Or even if you want to come back with your sword, uh, with your horsemen, like horse archers here, or knights, or some like high value units that you want to heal up. It's definitely worth it. Plutum in front of the entrance of the healer. And yeah. One thing about the entrance, side note here. The entrance is always facing the way that the campfire is facing from the keep. Okay, so far so good. Now we are going into the um, fire distinguishing department here. We have the well which costs 3 stone and we have the water pot which costs 60 gold. So either or if you have only stone left or if only gold left you can decide which one you have to place in a quick defense. But um, yeah it's always advised to build the, sto uh, the stone costing well of course which is a bit cheaper and usually it's better to like spread out your fire department. Yeah, uh, fear factor hasn't changed, so I don't re really cover that. Um, anything else that got changed? Yeah, I think we've covered everything now. Um, you can check out the exact uh, health values of all of the buildings. Yeah, maybe one of the other things that we've forgotten. Yeah, the big gatehouse, of course, has a lot of health. You already know this one. Uh, this costs now 15 stone, just so it's not buildable by just one stone delivery. It's like uh, often used also for climbing up some ramps, giving you a huge advantage. And yeah, one more thing before we go, and that is the dog cage. The dog cage is basically a quick defense against enemy fighting units. I've already mentioned this in my uh, little bootstrap video. Check it out, it came out yesterday. Yeah, let's see. Um, dog cages basically, you can see the dogs just completely obliterate my units here. Got buffed insanely and uh, are kind of worth as a static defense, but at some point, this will not kill them, don't worry. At some point, if you have enough units, you might, um, they actually, actually were enough. You might kill the dog cages here because of the, their stacking power. And the dogs also con like retain their health values after the after they go back to their dog cage. But there's one special, like there's two special tactics to counter them. One of them is like, as soon as you have two assassins, right? Let's, let's simulate this. Let's have two assassins and the dogs will come out, right? They will kill the assassins easily. But if you have just one assassin, the dogs don't get triggered. They only get triggered after a certain threshold. And with one assassin alone, you can kill all dog cages one by one, if your opponent doesn't watch. And there's another way to, to trick the dog cages, for example like this, you send in some troops that get triggered, that trigger the dogs, right? And then you run away from the dogs and you bait the dogs into your archers, like you have like some archers around here. And then you just kill the dogs for free. The dogs chase the unit that they first saw, indefinitely almost until they killed it, then they run back. And that way you can bait them out and yeah, basically make your archers uh, kill the dogs for free. Yeah, that is all, I think. I think we've covered all of the new introduced uh, balance changes. If I forgot anything, you will find it, of course, on the GitHub. Check the link out for further questions and post your other questions in the comments. And I see you soon in the Wolfsburg tournament on the battlefield. But for now, I hope you could uh, watch the whole video up to the end. And if you've made it this far, write Gorkensalat in the comments as well. Bye.